In this video, I'm gonna walk you through step-by-step -step how you can edit an entire wedding in less than one hour. My name is Pi. I've been fortunate to create multiple successful companies in the photography space. I'm a photographer, but even more so, I would say I'm an educator and frameworks person. My specialty, making complex subjects easy for you to master, right here on Adorama TV. We're gonna get started, and to keep this video short and to the point, I'm narrating it, and we're gonna cut in the B-roll so that you can reference it at any time that you need. So bookmark it, save it, use it as you will. Now, to speed you up in post-production, we need to first start with what you're doing in production. So let's start with how you shoot. Number one, I want you to shoot medium or compressed raw file formats. The first thing is that you want to make sure that you're shooting raw. Shooting raw not only allows you to fix mistakes and it offers more flexibility when editing in post, it's also going to allow you to use AI based editing systems, which we're going to cover in just a moment. But the thing is here that you might not need full resolution or uncompressed raw files. For example, on a Canon R5, you have the option of shooting full resolution raw files, but with either a compressed or uncompressed file size. Compared to a standard RAW file, the CRAW is one half to one third the file size with little to no difference in quality. This not only saves storage space, it makes your editor run that much faster. Now, if you don't have compressed RAW functionality, then see if your camera has the option to just lower the resolution a bit. Your camera might be able to shoot 50 plus megapixel RAW files, but you don't need more than 20 to 30 for general portrait work. Plus, those 50 to 100 megabyte files are going to slow down your computer and editing workflow to an absolute crawl. Number two, when shooting, shoot in manual mode. In order to create an efficient post-production workflow, you need to be working with consistent exposures. And the problem with any of the automated modes, including aperture and shutter priority, is that your exposures within a given scene are going to vary depending what your camera is pointing at, whatever's in your frame. This immediately creates exposure adjustments that you need to fix in post. So instead, shoot in manual mode. You'll need to get used to kind of adjusting your camera settings on the fly, but with a bit of practice, this is gonna come quick to you. Then as you move from one scene to another, or as the lighting changes, you're simply gonna adjust your exposure to match that scene. Once adjusted, you'll get consistent exposures regardless of where your camera's pointing. Step three, you're gonna adjust temperature and tint per scene in camera. This one's easy to forget, so I want you to take this step by step. While you're in the phase of getting comfortable shooting manual mode, it's fine to just use AWB or auto white balance. But as soon as you're comfortable adjusting your manual mode exposure settings, then I want you to add to that equation. Each time you walk into a new scene or whenever the lighting changes, in addition to adjusting your exposure, I want you to at least adjust your temperature. Bonus points if you also adjust your tint as well, but at least get temperature dialed into where you'd like it. Now, this simple step is not only going to save you a tremendous amount of time from having to adjust your white balance in post, it's also going to help your AI-based editor to understand your intentions within a given scene. It's easy to forget this, so tie a string around your finger, do whatever you got to to remind yourself until adjusting your temperature is just as natural as adjusting your exposure. Four, use a high-speed card and reader. Until cameras are shooting straight to the cloud, which we're not far from, we still need to use memory cards, unfortunately. And I'm going to say this, memory cards and memory card readers, they're not created equally. You want to make sure that you're using both a high-speed memory card and a high-speed memory card reader. We're going to link up the ones that we'd recommend in the description of the video. But look, even if you have just one memory card, a high-speed reader is going to shave off 10 minutes just from the import process. And if you're importing multiple cards, this can be hours of extra time just waiting around per shoot. Number five, when importing into Lightroom Classic, how you import actually matters. So look, on import, you're gonna select the following options. Build previews, select minimal. Make sure to check build smart previews option since you're gonna be editing with those smart previews. I also turn on don't import suspected duplicates and I leave the other options blank since I'm gonna be backing up our images and catalogs manually. Now this step though is another big one. If you're gonna be editing your images manually, then go ahead and select the baseline look or preset that you want to apply to all of your images. We use Visual Flow presets for all of our work and for import, we'll select the soft light preset for whatever pack that you're using. But if you're going to use an AI based editor in your workflow like Impossible Things, then go ahead and select none for the develop settings because this is gonna slow down your import. If you like, add your metadata preset and then let's get to the destination piece. Six, import to your fastest internal drive. Do not import your images and work from external hard drives. Look, editing and sorting through large volumes of high resolution images requires tons of data bandwidth. 
The quickest way for you to slow down your entire workflow is to use an external hard drive. Thing is, if you're going to use an external hard drive, then at least make sure it's an SSD that's connected through the fastest port that you have available. Ideally though, you wanna import your images and keep your catalogs on a local hard drive that's ideally also an SSD drive. So internal SSDs are gonna be your best bet for making sure that you don't run into data or bandwidth issues. Personally, even if my internal drive is not an SSD, I would still opt to use that internal drive over most external ones. Okay, so you've selected the location, go ahead and press import. Seven, I want you to simplify your culling process. You're gonna cull in versus cull out. So now that your images are imported, it's time to cull them down to what you actually want to edit and deliver. One of the biggest mistakes photographers make is they overcomplicate the culling process. They set meanings on like star ratings and color systems. One star means a reject, two means, well, maybe three is a keeper, four stars is great, and five, well, that's a portfolio image. The problem with this is that any type of culling system where you're applying ratings and meaning to an image that requires thought. So as you move from one image to the next, you're trying to make judgment calls on where that image fits into your rating system. This takes a tremendous amount of time and brain power. Instead, I want you to cull using what we call a culling in system. This is what it means. It means that you're going to assume that every image, well, is going to be rejected unless you flag it as a keeper. So as you move from one image to the next, you're thinking one thing, do I want to deliver this image? If so, press P for pick, otherwise just leave it unflagged. The goal is the simplest thought process possible with the minimum amount of keystrokes. And for extra efficiency, you can also turn on the auto advance option so that once you rate an image, it's gonna automatically move you to the next one. This is gonna further reduce your keystrokes, but simplify your culling process and cull in. Eight, you're gonna use AI based editors to do all the basic color grading. Now look, at this point in, in tech development, I'd highly recommend that you skip manually editing your images. But if you wanna do that, I'm gonna give you some suggestions for that as well. For right now though, as one of the developers for Visual Flow, I gotta tell you, I wasn't happy with the AI editing options available. So we teamed up with Develop, we made our own. It's called Impossible Things. It's a Lightroom native plugin, which means that all you have to do after you cull is select the keepers, then go to File, Plugin Extras, Edit Photos. Impossible Things is the only AI editor that can be used with the entire Visual Flow and Develop preset library. In fact, Impossible Things is also the only current AI that I know of that actually works with your own presets as well. All you have to do is choose the preset pack or your own preset that you'd like to use. From there, you can add in adaptive lens corrections, noise reduction, you can even have Impossible Things automatically add AI enhancement masking and even basic retouching to these photographs. Oh, and it does all of this in a fraction of a second per photograph. So once you've got the settings dialed in, press proceed and it does the rest. Now, Impossible Things is very affordable, but keep in mind that this option is gonna be ideal for working professionals since there is an editing cost with each image that you have the AI edit. From there, most of my work is done for me as it will be for you. So once it's done, you're just gonna to skip to step 10. You're gonna review for consistency, make minor adjustments, and then go ahead and edit your favorites with like a signature edit. But for now, I'm gonna give you a few tips as well when it comes to manual editing in case AI solutions aren't for you. So nine manually editing and sync per scene. Now, if you're editing manually, you should have already imported with a baseline preset. From here though, I suggest that you work by camera and by scene. I'm gonna show you what I mean. Let's assume that you're just using one camera. Then what you're gonna do is select the first image within a scene, go ahead and make your adjustments to finalize that image. Then once you're done, select the last image in that scene, and then you're gonna press Control Shift S or Command Shift S to synchronize the setting from the edited images to the remaining ones. There are, by the way, a few different ways of doing this. This is just one way of batch processing. Then you're gonna repeat this process for each of those scenes until you finish the entire set. But if you're working with multiple cameras, let's say a second or a third shooter, then you're gonna to wanna to first filter for one camera. And I'll usually do this by camera serial number because sometimes people are using the same type of camera. Edit the first image and synchronize it across the scene, then select the second camera and do the same. 
This step is necessary because each photographer might have different settings and despite shooting in the same environment, well, those settings and exposures might be just a little bit different. Side note, again, this is where an AI based editor like Impossible Things will really shine because they're going to do all that work for you. They're going to sync all the cameras and all the adjustments together. Expect that if you are manually editing and syncing, this is not going to be a one hour workflow for a wedding. It is going to take you substantially longer, but you'll still have a blazing fast manual workflow if you follow all the other steps. 10. Your final review and signature edits. So before I deliver, I'm always going to review and then create my signature edits on each catalog. During your final review, whether you're using an AI based workflow or a manual workflow, it's still a good idea to review image to image consistency and make minor adjustments as needed. While you review, also mark your favorite images with a five star rating or whatever rating you'd like. You're gonna save these images for last so you can put a little more love into them. When you finish that review, then go ahead and select those five star images and then give them a little extra love. Some Lightroom local adjustments, some dodging, some burning, just to make those images pop. These are my signature edits. They're the images that I know I want to have featured in albums, on blog posts, on social media, and so forth. They're my favorites, and I want them to have really the signature processing applied to them. Once you're done with this last step, go ahead and export and prepare your set for delivery. That's it. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, you know what to do. Save the video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And like always, like, subscribe, and we'll see you guys next week. Peace.